So uh, with that, let's uh, get on with the show. Today we have uh, Dr. Adam Philippi from NIH talking to us about the marvelous wonders of insect genome uh, sequencing and assembly. So I'll let you take it away, Adam. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, you're a little bit quiet, but we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the invitation. Whenever I get invited to do these things, I always have grand plans about what I would like to show you. And um, when Anna invited me to do this one, I thought it would be a great opportunity through some of the pitfalls that we've experienced assembling insect genomes over the years. Um, but then my uh, youngest kid had the flu all week, and the Eagles finally won the Super Bowl, and so <laughs> my, my time was a little more limited than I expected it to be. But um, I put together what I think uh, is a good overview of some of the problems and successes we've had over the years. And let me see if I can advance my. So I always start with a little primer on the genome assembly problem. Um, I realize that the I5K group is probably well versed with this, but it's always worthwhile if there's newcomers. This, um, I typically describe the genome assembly problem uh, as putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Um, rather than putting together these pictures, we're putting together the genome. And this is a cartoon that came out around the time the Human Genome Project was finished. Um, and kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the problem. We had millions and millions of these short reads we had to piece back together into the genome. This turns out to be a very hard um, yet rewarding computational uh, my one for the past decade or so. There's a very simple observation that when you're doing a genome, uh, just like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, having big makes the problem much easier. Uh, and so sometimes I use this analogy of you took uh, the first printing of some book, ran it through a shredder, and you're left with the pieces, and you have to piece the book of the genome back together again. And if you're dealing with, uh, say, short 50 base pair Illumina reads, you know, 10 years ago, some of you might be familiar with that headache. It's like having shreds of paper that just have a single word on it, uh, and it's very hard to find the context of that to then piece the genome back together again from just a single word. And so um, these kind of reads, I they are analogous to like simple sequence repeats. They occur uh, in this particular book I'm talking about over a thousand times, and so you can't confidently reconstruct. Um, as the sequencing reads get longer and your shreds of paper get longer, it becomes a little more easy to place where documents are coming from. So in this book, it was, appears 320 times, so maybe like a transposable element. Um, it was the best occurs twice in this book, so maybe like a segmental duplication. And when I come out to a uh, length six read size for this book, it's clear we're talking about Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. Only occurs once in this book, and so you can uniquely place it and then reconstruct the genome if you have reads um, of sufficient length. Um, but read length isn't everything. There's always some repeats that are longer than your read length. Um, and in this case, with his hands in his pockets is a uh, phrase that actually I'm sorry, a six-word phrase occurs three times in the same Dickens Tale of Two Cities. And so sometimes I refer to this phrase as a metagenomic repeat because, in fact, with his hands in his pockets occurs in every book that Charles Dickens ever wrote, um, and only a bioinformatician who likes to play with cameras would know that. <laughs> but it's something I figured out years ago when we were looking at these analogies. And so I like to put uh, puzzles together that are much easier than the short read puzzles, and so our group has been focused on long read assembly um, because we were confident we could get much clearer reconstructions of the puzzles using bigger pieces than short pieces. Um, so is this really the solution to all of our problems? If, if there's a lot of perils with insect genomes, if we just get longer and longer reads, um, this hope to give us was our hope. And so um, maybe five or so, we dedicated a lot of effort to this problem. Um, and started work on what we now call the canoe assembler. Um, this was primarily work done by Brian Wallens and Sergey Korn in the top right here. Um, and it's really a reinvention of the Solera assembler, which has been around for years, um, but repurposed for the new challenges of long reads. And so we just published this in 2017 in Genome Research last year, um, but it's been around in various flavors for the past five years or so. Um, there's a couple of problems we wanted to address. The first is that long read data 
currently is quite noisy, meaning that the error rate is much higher than you would get for Illumina data. Um, you have eight of maybe 10 to 15 percent chimeric uh, reads um, and some um, where you have essentially falsely ligated segments together. Um, also, you have this very large graph for uh, a complex repetitive insect human genome. Um, you have these very long, very noisy overlaps that turns into a very big uh, assembly graph, and so it can be computationally expensive. And so we address these two problems by coming up with new solutions for clustering and correcting and trimming these long reads, um, and doing that in a very fast and efficient manner um, using the cache approach. Um, the initial results for this we proved on Drosophila melanogaster. It was kind of the first um, largest insect genome that we worked on. And um, Solera Assembler, you could, with a lot of uh, work, get it to run on these genomes and these new data types. And Brian Wallens, in particular, spent a lot of time patching that old assembler to make it work. But it was ridiculously slow because it wasn't tuned for these very noisy reads. So the first assembly of this genome, which we had PAC bio data for, took over 600,000 CPU hours. But it did result in a very nice assembly with a 15 megabase pair contig NG50 size, so basically an average contig size. But development of these new algorithms in CANU, the first version of CANU can assemble that same data set in just about 500 CPU hours and actually give you a better, more contiguous, and more accurate same data set. Um, and so I use this just as an example that a lot of times when these new data types come out, initially they're very to work with because the algorithms haven't been adapted for them. But once you uh, choose and apply the correct algorithms for these tests, you can get very good results. And so this Drosophila melanogaster assembly was really the first um, largest eukaryotic genome that was assembled essentially from telomere to centromere in complete pieces. And so this is showing a bandage plot of that first assembly as it was published in our 2015 paper. Uh, this is relatively high coverage of an inbred ISO-1 line of melanogaster, the same one that the first genome project was done on in the early 2000s. And each of these colored lines is representing a single contact uh, with the chromosome arms. And so you can see for the four large chromosome arms, they're all essentially in a single contig with no gaps stretching from telomere to centromere with really only the histone cluster on 2L um, and the sex chromosomes, which are largely uh, heterochromatic, um, remaining to be assembled. And so this was really astonishing to me at the time to see the power of these long reads because it was the first time we were really able to reconstruct uh, a complex genome like this from telomere to centromere without gaps. So can long reads solve assembly in all cases? Um, if I go back along the timeline, um, Sergey Korin and myself and others at the USDA uh, proved that you could complete bacterial genomes, um, essentially close them in a single piece. Here I think I'm showing maybe a Yersinia pestis genome or something that has a complete chromosome. This is the assembly graph and two little plasmids down on the bottom left. That was about 2012. If we go up in order of magnitude, we could assemble complete yeast chromosomes, even across the centromeres, because they're, they're point centromeres rather than larger ones, um, around 2014. Another order of magnitude up to Drosophila, and that was the result I just showed, also in 2014, where we could assemble most of the um, euchromatin for Drosophila without gaps. And so if you extrapolate out, we should be at the point now where we can assemble a human genome without gaps, since we're another order of magnitude up. But we haven't quite reached this point yet because of larger segmental duplication and longer stretches of heterochromatin within the human genome. But I expect within the next couple of years, uh, we will see gapless human assemblies thanks to these long reads. Um, and just a note on the bottom of this slide, I edited a special issue of genome research last year um, focused on new advances in sequence assembly um, that covered some of these results and has some interesting papers on kind of the state of the art um, for assembling both long reads and, and other uh, emerging technologies. One of the more interesting developments within the past few years, uh, we actually just last week 
um, on Manafort sequencing and its ability to sequence what we're calling ultra-long reads. So uh, the PAC bio read length from those projects that I just presented were on the order of 10 to 20 KB uh, and 50 read lengths, um, which are kind of the current best you can do with PAC biotechnology. Um, but with the Manafort sequencing device, we're able to get much longer read lengths, and the hope is that just like the door of the Explorer puzzle, the much longer read lengths will lead to more complete assemblies. Um, so I like to show this slide of the dimensions of a nanopore just because it's kind of mind boggling when you think about the physics of this all. So currently the Oxford nanopore uh, minion, so this is this pocket sized device you've probably seen, um, uses an engineered uh, E. coli membrane protein, CSGG, um, which has the dimensions shown here on this slide. And you thread a single strand of the DNA down through that pore um, and measure uh, changes in current over time uh, of the ionic flow through that pore being obstructed by the DNA strand that's in there. And the dimensions are pretty mind-blowing. If you scale that pore up to, say, the size of my fist, and then say you're going to stream through uh, a one megabase pair length uh, piece of DNA at the same dimensions, that's like threading three kilometers of rope or eight Empire State Buildings worth of rope uh, through your fist in the order of, of uh, minutes to uh, the basis of that DNA. Exciting from a technology perspective, engineering perspective. And more recently, we've started to apply this to sequencing human genomes. Um, the paper that I mentioned that just came out last week was in Nature Biotechnology that was describing uh, the sequencing of this GM12878 human reference sample um, that's from kind of a northern central European pedigree um, from the old Ceph lines, cell lines you can order from Coriel. And that was sequenced by multiple labs. I'm showing Matt Luce here, who was the senior corresponding author on this paper. I think sequencing DNA on a minion in his AGBT hotel room a few years ago. Um, and among the groups that were involved, we collected over the course of a month or so 35x coverage of this genome with a 11 KB and 50 read length, um, resulting in a three megabase pair and 50 contig length. Um, in parallel, Clive Brown, who's the chief technology officer at ONT, sequenced his own genome, um, doing his own DNA extraction on his blood samples, sequencing him himself uh, to 60x coverage on minions. Uh, in a lab at Oxford Nanopore, um, and it achieved a 20 KB and 50 read length. Um, and I'll show results that Sergey Korin in my lab assembled that to about a 30 megabase pair and 50 contig length, um, which are just extraordinary uh, continuity results um, and is essentially the longest contigs to ever be reported for a human genome. Now, the caveat here is on really shown the results for the ultra-long read that was on the standard sample preparation. If you include these ultra-long reads, which I'll show on the next slide, um, even just 3 to 5x additional coverage of those very long reads uh, doubles the N50 contig size um, in this case of the AGBT sequencing room. <laughs> and the protocols for this were really developed by Josh Quick and Nick Lohman at University of Birmingham, who have been drivers um, of sample preparations onto the nanopore to get these extremely long reads. Uh, and in the best cases, uh, Josh has been able to achieve 100 KB read and 50 length with maximum reads recently exceeding one megabase pair on a single read. So no assembly required. You just get a read off of the nanopore device that's over a megabase long. Um, really just going back to basics in terms of DNA preparation, just very gentle handling, um, lysing of the cells, very gentle handling of the DNA device currently using the uh, the rapid kit from Nanopore, which is the transposase based prep. And the histogram is here on the bottom. Um, if you look at the bottom panel, which is showing the histogram for the ultra-long read prep, you can see that over 50% of the mass of this data is in read lengths over 100 kb long. And so this is extremely useful um, for assembly and phasing applications. I also like to show kind of uh, an illustration of how far we've come since 2001. And so this illustration is showing the state of the human reference genome when it was announced complete um, in 2001 to great fanfare. Um, the secret of this is that really the contigs at the time were quite fragmented compared to current standards. 
and the N50 average contig length was only half a megabase pair in the uh, REF28 release. And so each of these bands on this ideogram are showing individual contigs, and the color changes between uh, any two of those bands represents a gap in the assembly. Um, so either a gap in the scaffolds or, or just missing sequence. And the white represents things that are still unknown in the current reference, mostly uh, heterochromatin. If we fast forward now to Sergei's assembly of the Clivome in 2017 um, on the data that I presented a few slides ago, uh, this represents the continuity of that assembly of a single individual sequenced by himself on these nanopore devices and assembled with our canoe assembler. And so this is what 60x coverage of a nanopore human genome looks like with a 29.5 megabase pair contig and 50. Some of the chromosome arms now, like the short arm of two here, essentially have a single unbroken alignable contig from telomere to centromere output straight from the assembler without any intervention. And so a huge advancement in terms of continuity. Now the catch here is that the clivome isn't nearly as accurate at a base level um, but from a structural level and a continuity level, um, it's much more complete. So um, quite amazing to think we came from 2001, rooms full of these giant ABI sequencers um, to get uh, a half a megabase pair contig and 50 size to now having a single individual with a 30 megabase pair contig size. But I'm kind of pulling a sleight of hand here because I decided this talk would be about insects and Clive Brown is certainly not an insect. Um, and so there's a lot of caveats here. We can't quite do as well on certain insect genomes. And so I'd like to go through um, now the, the pleasures and perils. But we'll skip right to the perils because there aren't a whole lot of pleasures except <laughs> for what Rob said on Twitter of the pleasures of hard work. Um, we'll go through the perils instead in this slide. The first that we continually run into is when we try to sequence tiny things these long read sequencing technologies require a lot of DNA. So, you know, a PAC bio library currently requires maybe five micrograms or so of DNA. Um, a single nanopore library prep is around a microgram. If you want to do the ultra long reads, you need much more. And so, in many cases, for tiny, tiny bugs, you can't get enough DNA from a single individual um, to do the sequencing. And that causes problems I'll talk about in a bit. Um, Furthermore, you run a contamination risk. As the things you sequence get smaller and smaller, there's a higher fraction of microbial DNA now relative to your target genome, um, and you have to be very careful of that. When you're sequencing something big like a human straight from blood, the amount of microbial DNA is a small fraction compared to human DNA, so it's not as much of an issue. The next peril is repeats. Um, human genomes actually uh, are quite easy to assemble, and every human genome is very similar to every other human genome. Um, when you get to something as broad phylogenetically as all insects or arthropods, um, every genome is its unique snowflake and has its own repeat <laughs> content that can pose its own challenges. <laughs> and then lastly, you have the diversity issue that if we can't sequence a single individual and we can't get enough DNA extracted from a single individual, what we end up doing um, both in the Drosophila project and uh, the mosquito project I'll talk about, is we run a whole bunch of bugs through a grinder and then throw that population of DNAs onto, say, a PAC bio instrument. And in this application, you're essentially sequencing a metagenome where each of those individuals has their own unique genome, and now you've combined them all, sequenced them, and are trying to assemble a population of genomes rather than a single genome. And this is extremely hard given the variability that exists in some of these insect populations, um, especially for those that can't be inbred easily. Drosophila, I wish all insects were Drosophila. So easy to inbreed and get a nice, clean, single haplotype reconstruction. But mosquitoes, as we've found time and time again, a much different beast. Um, and then, of course, there's things with long generation times that, you know, uh, are a challenge to do any inbreeding on. So I'll go through these one by one. Um, the first one uh, I'll hold up as an example that I wasn't involved with, but I think it's a good cautionary tale. Uh, you might have heard of it as Tardigate if you're on Twitter. Um, I wasn't involved with this, but that's uh, my little girl who had the flu this week uh, looking at her own tardigrades. Uh, uh, I captured that pic on my iPhone actually looking down through the scope. 
Um, and I realize the tardigrades aren't necessarily arthropods, but similar characteristics in terms of uh, the perils you have to watch out for. Um, if you're not familiar with tardigrades, the quick storyline is that there was a paper out of University of North Carolina claiming uh, to see extensive horizontal gene transfer between microbial populations and the tardigrade uh, animals. And when you look closely at that, as was done in a follow-up paper, um, a lot of that potential horizontal transfer could likely be explained by contamination in the original sequencing. And so shown here are two blob plots um, mm -hmm. from the follow-up in PNAS in 2016. On the left-hand side, each of the individual circles uh, is a scaffold um, separated by their GC content um, and their coverage and map short read data on the two axes. Uh, and when you plot it out in that manner, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a lot of stuff in the sample that doesn't look like tardigrade DNA in the UNC assembly. When you look at the Edinburgh assembly, um, which did careful contamination screening, you see a lot of this gets cleaned up, and now the GC and coverage looks much more uniform compared to the one that didn't go through the contamination screen prior to assembly. And if you go through then and look at the scaffolds and try and classify what they look like in the contaminated assembly from UNC, you see a lot of bacter IDDs and other things that clearly um, aren't tardigrade DNA. And so this, I think, serves as a great cautionary tale that you really need to be careful when you're sequencing these small things that you're taking care uh, to avoid any kind of microbial contamination that might come along with your sample. On to the problem of repeats. Um, so the cautionary tale here uh, from my lab was the mealworm beetle that Brenda Oppert at USDA had given us a couple of years ago, and we were helping her run canoe, and she was running it on her own cluster and got back to us saying, why isn't canoe finishing? It's just running forever, on and on and on. We look back at the literature, 1989, there was this paper telling us that we should expect the mealworm beetle to be 60% satellite DNA in its genome, composed of a pretty well-conserved 142 nucleotide repeat. And so not knowing this going into the project, you end up getting overwhelmed by this huge amount of repeat, very simple sequence repeat content that's very difficult to assemble. And if the assembler is not prepared for this, uh, it's going to do a terrible job. Luckily, in this case, um, Canoe has options that allow it to deal with such sequences, and so with some parameter adjustment to deal with this, um, we were able to get an assembly through, basically by screening and weighting the repeats more aggressively than by default. And so this just goes to show, if you're starting a new bug, you never know what to expect when you do the sequencing. There can be really interesting repeat expansions in some of these things uh, that make assembly very challenging. And then lastly, what the rest of this talk will focus on is this problem of diversity when you're sequencing heterozygous diploids that are very hard to uh, separate um, or inbreed. And the strategy in the past has been either to inbreed or to just grind up a sequence of, say, sibling mate offspring um, or even just native populations, grind that up, sequence it, in the case of PacBio, that requires like 100 or more mosquitoes to get enough DNA to build the libraries. And then you end up with, you know, maybe more than two alleles at each locus and unknown polymorphisms in the genome, structural polymorphisms that could be inversions or integrations. And we really don't have a good handle on this still, that every time we look at one of these mosquito genomes, we have the same uh, symptom that there's a lot of diversity there. Um, but we haven't really pinned down the source of that diversity yet, and so I'll talk about that in a bit. So when we talk about heterozygosity, I just want to get some terminology out of the way as it relates to assembly. Um, this is actually from the Supernova paper in genome research last year, um, and I'll borrow some of the terminology from that paper. So this is the 10X genomics assembler, that when you say not even a population, but you just have a diploid genome from a single individual, typically the assembler will represent this as a graph structure where regions of the genome that are essentially homozygous uh, at some threshold get collapsed into a single path here in black. And the heterozygous alleles, if they're sufficiently diverged, separate out into these bubble structures where the blue path represents one haplotype and the yellow path represents the other haplotype. 
but without sufficient long-range information, you can't fully separate the haplotypes. And so you end up with bubbles that are interspersed with these collapsed homozygous alleles. And so some terminology for dealing with these things, um, if you've heard the term haplotigs, um, usually I think of haplotigs as a, a haplotype-specific sequence. Um, and so a sequence that either represents a homozygous allele or one haplotype um, out of the genome. So here shown in red, each of those little red lines would represent what I think of as haplotypes, uh, haplotigs from this diploid assembly graph. Uh, and competing a solution which can give you more continuity in your assembly is what assemblers like Falcon Unzip and Supernova provide, um, which I'll call pseudo-haplotypes. Um, Falcon calls this the primary contig set. Um, and these pseudo-haplotypes are sometimes provided with alts, um, alternate haplotypes. And the idea of a pseudo-haplotype is that you can't necessarily figure out the phase between all of these bubbles but you may want to preserve continuity for analysis purposes. And so you essentially just randomly walk one half of these bubbles. In the case of Falcon Unzip, I think it always takes the longest half of the bubble, but other ones might do this randomly. Um, and the result is this pseudo-haplotype where you have a long contig in red, which actually has phase switching between these bubbles, um, but preserves continuity. And then the alternate haplotypes are as secondary contigs or alternate contigs. Um, which are usually haplotype specific, but also um, not connected uh, between uh, one another. Ultimately, what we really want is complete haplotypes out of the assembler, where we've accurately walked the blue and the yellow haplotype, and we would output essentially two haplotigs for each chromosome representing the two haplotypes. That's obviously very difficult to do. The reality certainly is not as simple as those little cartoons um, from the supernova paper. If we just do an experiment where we take, for instance, two highly related E. coli strains and we co-assemble them and look at the diploid assembly graph, we get something uh, that I show here on the right. And for the majority of the chromosome, the bubbles are pretty well behaved. You can see them popping up where there's haplotype difference between these two E. coli as you go around. But then when you hit the highly repetitive regions of E. coli, so this is around the rDNA loci, it becomes difficult to separate the haplotype differences from repeat structures in the graph. And this is really what causes the assembly problem, is that it can be hard to tell what's a duplicated <laughs> allele on a single haplotype from two cells on multiple haplotypes. And the graph structure looks much worse than this when we get into say, diploid insect genomes. This is just a trivial E. coli example. And so imagine now we've mixed an unknown number of alleles, mixed with different abundances, put it through the meat grinder, sequenced it all, plus we have high copy repeat families like we showed, say, in the mealworm beetle um, that are also variable in their copy number, um, expand and contract frequently between haplotypes. The problem just gets very, very complex. And so one recent example um, is the 80s Egypti reference project um, led primarily by Leslie Vosshall at Rockefeller in an attempt to apply these long-read sequencing technologies to get an improved 80s Egypti reference genome. And when we first assembled this genome, we tried both Falcon on Zip and Canoe, and based on previous um, flow sorting information, we expect the genome should be about 1.3 gigabases but the assemblies that come out of these assemblers are, in fact, much, much larger. Canoe, actually, the first assembly had a 2.8 gigabase pair assembly size, almost twice um, the expected. And Falcon and Zip, um, which was collapsing a little bit more of the diversity, uh, it, too, had a 1.7 gigabase pair uh, pseudohaplotype, this primary contig size. And so a lot of effort was spent dealing with these expanded assemblies to try and deduplicate them. Um, and in this case, we had some high C data, uh, as well as aligning the contigs to one another to try and identify what looked like alternate alleles on different haplotypes and excluding them from the assembly so we could try to have a reference genome that represented only a single allele at each locus rather than having artificial duplication. It's still 
I would argue not perfect. I expect there would be some artifactual duplication um, or maybe even some missing sequence in these assemblies, but we gave it our best shot. And the result is a very continuous um, Katie the Gypsy assembly, uh, and the description of this is currently up on BioArchive. Um, and as I'll show on some forthcoming slides, the application of this high C data type allowed us to get chromosome scale uh, scaffolds in the case of this mosquito. But really the headache was the heterozygosity and this duplicated problem. So the reference uh, assembly problem, we're currently evaluating a number of recipes for generating these new genomes de novo and try to minimize the amount of manual intervention required. Really, it comes down to this problem that even the long reads uh, can give you very long contigs, but they still don't put those contigs together into complete chromosomes. In particular, the um, of these chromosomes are, you know, multiple megabases in some cases, all heterochromatic. Um, and cannot be assembled across with current sequencing technologies. But there are scaffolding technologies that can help us put the chromosomes back together de novo, uh, and that's currently a heavy focus of a lot of assembly research. And so what are the available options once we have contigs from PacBio sequencing to stitch them back together um, into longer scaffolds? And so the scaffolding problem has been around since the days of Sanger sequencing, and I'm showing here a little cartoon on the top right, usually it comes as a pair of linked together um, based on some physical evidence. In the old days, you would have some, say, back clone um, where you have a size estimate that you know those two pairs should be separated by some size. Uh, in current Illumina paired end sequencing, you could get maybe like a 1 kb uh, insert size on paired ends, and you would get a distribution, basically, uh, between those two pairs. If you pick any two pairs, they would be separated by some distance, which has a median around 1 kb, but there's some noise in those variants, so you get a distribution like this. There's new approaches, say, from 10x genomics or BioNano, which have, uh, in the case of 10x genomics, maybe a 100 kilobase pair originating fragment that you sample reads from that are then barcoded based on their fragment of origin. Or in the case of BioNano, you have very long um, optical reads that you've then labeled at known restriction sites, and these optical reads can be 300 kb uh, and longer. And so if you think about those originating fragments, if you pick the very first read or the very first restriction site and the very last read, last restriction site, that's almost like a pair uh, in the traditional sense that could be separated by 100 or 300 kb insert distance. And so you get these kind of linear distributions. If you pick any pair of reads from a 10x fragment, um, that's the expected distribution of separations. Um, there's also the Chicago method, which is the uh, uh, related high C type technology that gives you this exponential decay in interactions, but up to about the same lengths you could get for BioNano. And that's because the Chicago libraries are built based on extracted DNA, so you're really limited to the size of the extracted DNA molecules. Um, but the one that we've really been spending a lot of effort looking at is the high C data type, where um, you're actually cross linking the DNA um, in the uh, unliced cells, and so this is happening before DNA extraction, and so you can get interaction distances up to the length of entire chromosomes, and that can be very helpful for scaffolding. And so the high c technique um, can be drawn as this simple schematic here where you uh, cross-link the DNA initially. Uh, that cross-linked DNA then gets fragmented, usually using some kind of restriction in. Um, those proximal ends are then ligated back together again, and then you can use uh, a sequencing technology to sequence across the red-blue junction, and this essentially gives you a readout of places within the chromosome that we're interacting with one another. So say the red and the blue here are two different chromosomes uh, seeing a sequence of these ligated fragments that has some red and some blue on it would give you some evidence that you've seen those two chromosomes interacting with one another. Turned out this information, which was, you know, initially developed, these assays initially developed to give you the structure of the chromosome are actually quite handy also for scaffolding chromosomes because these interactions happen much more frequently between sites that are close in linear space. It's much more common to see a 3D interaction between DNA that's close in the 2D, uh, I'm sorry, the 1D strand 
uh, of the DNA. So if you have any two contigs, the more interactions you see between them, the more likely it is that those two contigs were close um, in the initial 1D strand of the genome. And so I'm showing here uh, a figure from the Juchinko paper in Science uh, last year, which was showing a re-scaffolding of the initial 80s of GIPTI reference genome from years ago using high C data. And this heat map is showing interaction frequencies between different regions of the genome. And you can see by the fact that interaction frequency is highest signal, that's showing you that regions, say, on 2P um, that are close to other regions on 2P have much more frequent interactions than elsewhere in the genome. The only exception in this figure are these off-diagonal dots where um, the centromeres are shown to be interacting with the other centromeres more frequently, and the telomeres are shown to be interacting with the other telomeres more frequently. And this is quite curious and is indicative of a rabble configuration of the chromosomes where essentially all of the centromeres are segregated together on one side um, and all of the telomeres are segregated together on the other side, increasing their So I'm also a part of this vertebrate genome project, which is aiming to sequence uh, a reference species for all of the vertebrate orders. Um, and so we're very interested in developing recipes that can create these reference genomes. Um, and currently we're taking the kitchen sink approach where we're uh, combining all available technologies that I've mentioned so far, PacBio, 10X Genomics, BioNano, and HiC, um, to try and get these de novo reference genomes without too much manual intervention. And the first application of this uh, kitchen sink recipe was for the goat genome, um, where we were able to get a reference quality chromosome scale assembly of the goat um, using these techniques. But what's really essential for creating these reference genomes de novo is to start with the long read. You can't get you would need for a reference genome if you're starting with a short read assembly. And so um, we're strong advocates for beginning with long reads and then adding in these other technologies as needed to get the chromosome scale scaffolds. Validation is hugely important um, and uh, important to both automate the validation and do a very thorough job to make sure that the genome has been reconstructed without significant errors. Um, and then a more recent observation is the importance of haplotype variation, in particular how important it is that you do not ignore it when you're doing these assemblies. And there was an interesting paper by Jonas Korlock and Eric Jarvis last year illustrating for some bird genomes that creep into your assemblies. If you just simply try to collapse the two haplotypes together, it can actually introduce errors that significantly affect your annotation downstream. And this problem is obviously amplified in the cases of these population um, experiments in the insect realm. One example of why haplotype variation is important is that when you're dealing with, say, these pseudohaplotypes, it's very hard to scaffold them. And so if we have here, say, a pseudohaplotype as output by Falcon Unzip, where I'm showing the alleles in yellow and blue, and so we have one Falcon primary contig that's switching between yellow and blue haplotypes, but reported as a single contig, if we come along then and try to scaffold or validate that with, say, an optical map, we have a long optical contig now, which is in correct phase because the reads have longer linkage information. Um, this appears like a conflict between the pseudohaplotype and the optical assembly because the optical map is telling us, okay, I've got yellow, yellow. The pseudohaplotype is telling me I've got yellow, blue. And so this might induce a break in the pseudohaplotype, which then optical mapping or high C might attempt to rescaffold after the fact. And you can end up with really bad artifacts like the scaffold interleaving problem, where now maybe instead of one scaffold representing one haplotype, I end up with two scaffolds that are representing the two haplotypes, but then they're interleaved with one another. Um, and it can be really hard to account for this, both in scaffolding or downstream um, analyses and can cause some of these duplication problems that we were seeing. The hard solution, um, which I think might be the correct solution, um, but it's still difficult to apply in practice, is to scaffold the graph. So rather than to deal with the pseudohaplotype and apply scaffolding information to that, which then can cause these artifacts and problems, to go back to the original assembly graph where we have this structure fully represented and then to apply the linkage information, so say these are high C pairs, 
that I'm now linking the blue haplotype to the blue haplotype in the bubbles, this could infer a walk through that scaffold graph that would preserve phase. And so with the correct algorithms, you might be able to then tease apart the complete blue haplotype and the complete yellow haplotype in this case. But um, this requires a lot of development on the algorithm side. We've come up recently with a much more easy solution. Um, the downside is that this only applies in the case where you have a trio. Um, and our first application, which we'll be posting a preprint on in the coming week, um, was applied to cattle genomes. So apologies, these aren't insects. Just imagine these silhouettes are, you know, giant bees or something like that. And in this case, we combined uh, an Angus father with a Brahmin mother. And so they each have their own um, either essentially subspecies of cattle. So they each have their own unique haplotypes in blue and red here. Um, you get an F1 cross between those individuals, which now essentially has an Angus haplotype from the father and a Brahmin haplotype from the mother. And you look at the camers um, from the parents. So you sequence, in addition to doing the cross with long reads, you do the parents with Illumina short reads, and you just take the camers from those and look for the camers that are unique to the paternal haplotypes and the camers that are unique to the maternal haplotypes. And so you certainly have some intersection where there's con conservation between those two subspecies. But in many cases, you have camers that are unique to either the mother or the father. And so you simply go through the, uh, the long reads of the F1 and classify each read individually prior to assembly. Does this read have more unique camers from the mother, or does it have more unique camers from the father? And you separate that into two bins, so the, hence why we call this trio binning. Um, so we now have a sire and a dam bin, and we assemble those individually completely separate from one another, uh, and that results in complete haplotypes um, for the F1, both the sire haplotype and the dam haplotype in this case. And in the case of these two cattle subspecies, over 99% of the initial raw PAC bio reads were assignable to the haplotypes prior to assembly, and so we get a very complete assembly of each haplotype as a result. And then when you want to go back and explore the differences between those two haplotypes, you have a linear reconstruction of each haplotype, so you can simply align them to one another to find very accurately all of the structural variation between them. And so this is uh, more advantageous than, say, inbreeding in my mind, because you have actual haplotypes of an actual living, breathing, healthy, happy uh, individual. And so to illustrate the difference between the pseudo-haplotype and the complete haplotype results. Um, I show here a falcon on zip assembly of that same F1 in a trio binning, trio canoe assembly of that F1. Each of the circles on these plots is a single contig, and the axes are the number of unique markers from the Brahmin and Angus haplotypes that you have in each contig. And so the fact that the falcon primary contigs kind of have an roughly equal proportion of Brahmin and Angus markers is telling you that we have this switching issue um, that I illustrated on a prior slide. And it's not that the two haplotypes are necessarily collapsed, it's just that uh, it'll go along as the Angus allele for a little bit, and then it'll go through a homozygous stretch, then it'll switch to a Brahmin allele for a little bit, and then switch back. In comparison, the trio canoe assembly, since we've pre bin these reads by haplotype, now the markers for each of these contigs are all either entirely coming from the Angus or entirely coming from the Brahmin, giving you confidence that they are haplotype-specific reconstructions. And they're very, very long. In this case, both of those two haplotypes were reconstructed with haplotigs with an N50 size greater than 20 megabase pairs um, for each haplotype. Um, and this is just illustrating that. Essentially, the continuity of these complete haplotypes so the Brahmin and Angus haplotypes are more continuous than the current reference genomes um, and are of similar continuity to the soon-to-be-released uh, new cattle uh, reference genome. Uh, with counting N50 size of around 20, 25 megabase pairs. And I just want to illustrate the importance of separating these haplotypes in regions of complex variation. And so here's an actual dot plot of the MHC class two region between the two haplotypes of this single F1 animal. And if you don't know how to read a dot plot, if these two haplotypes were identical, it would just be a straight diagonal. 
all of the gaps in this diagonal and this large region here are indicative of large structural variation between the two haplotypes of this animal. In particular, this region here is showing you that there's a large insertion in the Brahmin maternal haplotype relative to the Angus paternal haplotype. And this area here is showing that there's a region between the two haplotypes that's highly diverged, not necessarily an insertion or deletion, but it's a swap, essentially, um, for one gene for another gene. And if you were to assemble this diploid animal into a single consensus representation, you would end up with a, a haplotype that really represents nothing that exists in nature. It would be an artificial combination of these two haplotypes. But if you're careful with the phasing and reconstruction of each haplotype individually, you can preserve that. And that's very important for annotation of these um, usually highly repetitive and complex uh, immune gene families. And then lastly, to show the importance of long reads, uh, I show this plot, which is showing the difference between a trio canoe assembly of a human genome now and a 10x supernova assembly of that same human. Um, so this is the NA12878 reference sample. Um, supernova outputs two uh, pseudo haplotypes, um, just as trio canoe outputs two complete haplotypes for the maternal and the paternal. If you align those haplotypes to one another, you'll find structural variations between them. And this histogram is showing that around 300 base pairs, there's a large peak of structural variations found between the trio canoe haplotypes. Similarly, at 6,000 base pairs, these are alu elements and line elements, essentially, that trio canoe is able to identify between the two haplotypes. Those large structural insertions and deletions are largely missed by 10x supernova because it's relying on the short Illumina read data for its reconstructions, um, which are unable to reconstruct these large repeats. And so you'll miss that kind of structural variation. On the other hand, 10x supernova is very good at finding haplotype variation at the SNP level, and it will reconstruct quite well SNP variation between the haplotypes. But it's really the larger repeats and structural variation that you need the long reads to recover. And then finally, just to emphasize the importance of long read polishing, I think this often gets overlooked, that if you have a long read assembly, you can't simply expect to match short reads to that assembly and have it improve things necessarily. In the unique regions, this can be successful. But if you care about repeats or large gene families, this can actually have the opposite effect and introduce errors into your assembly. And so here I'm showing as an example in A array, which we've tested and validated in E. coli genomes, that there are subtle variations between individual gene copies, as I've shown here in red. If you try to map Illumina data to this assembly to correct it, the short reads will not map confidently to the repetitive genes because the short reads are too short to be accurately uh, anchored into those repeats. And so you'll essentially end up polishing only the unique regions of the genome. Or if you're not careful, um, you'll falsely map these to the repeats and introduce errors uh, into those. Whereas the long reads completely span those repeats, you can confidently anchor them to the genome and then use a tool like Arrow, as provided by PacBio, um, to confidently polish those repeats and get a very accurate representation of these repetitive gene families. And we've seen this and validated it um, in cases and shown that, in fact, some cases, if you try to polish a high-quality long read assembly with Illumina data, it can actually introduce errors into uh, these repetitive gene families. And the highest consensus quality sometimes comes from the long reads themselves. Um, the key point here is that you have to be aware of the haplotype variation, that if you're trying to map diploid reads to a haploid assembly, uh, that in itself will introduce errors. And so a lot of times if you see indel error in a packed bioassembly, um, it's because the polishing hasn't been done in a haplotype-aware manner. And so to wrap up, I just want to leave you with the thought that all assemblies are wrong. Some are useful. Um, this comes from my colleague Tim Smith at the USDA. Um, and some are useful at varying degrees. So, you know, the short read assemblies have gotten us uh, a fair way over the past 10 years. Um, they do recover a large proportion of the exon content in a genome, and they're useful for many things, particularly large population studies and so on. Um, but if you're interested in highly repetitive sequence, repetitive gene families, higher low GC regions, um, then they're not that useful. 
And that's when the long read assemblies uh, really come into their own. So I don't have time to go through all of this, but I'm going to put this up here just so that it's in uh, the slide deck when it gets posted. Uh, I probably missed tools on here because I threw this together literally 10 minutes before the talk off the top of my head of the tools that we're commonly running these days to do long read assemblies of both insects and larger genomes. Um, the tools listed in bold are ones that came out of my lab, but um, we're not restricted to running tools we write. We always use whatever tools give us the best results. And in fact, the uh, 80s Egypti assembly I presented was the output of Falcon Unzip. Um, there's new uh, assemblers coming out for long reads. Fly and WTDBG um, are both uh, currently available, and we're testing their abilities for these heterozygous genomes. Scaffolding here, SALSA and 3D DNA are for high C scaffolding. Um, high rise is Dovetail's uh, proprietary high C scaffolder, which works quite well in my experience, but it's uh, proprietary. Um, SCAF 10X and ARCs uh, are available for 10X based scaffolding, and BioNano has a good suite of tools for scaffolding with BioNano maps that we've had good success with. Uh, Quiver and Arrow for pack biopolishing, nanopolish for nanopore polishing. Um, I put an asterisk on nanopolish just because the quality that you can get from nanopore isn't quite what you can get from pack bio these days. Um, free bays and pylon for alumina based polishing, but to apply that with caution based on the caveats I said on the prior slides. Um, and PB Jelly uh, also has an asterisk. This is a gap filling tool, um, but we're finding more and more uh, it to be of limited use and prefer maybe Quiver and Arrow, which now. Quiver does some limited gap filling on pack bioassemblies. Um, and the caveat here is you have to be very careful um, when you're filling gaps with pack bio reads. Um, those were left as gaps in the initial uh, assembly for a reason, and you can introduce errors into the uh, resulting assemblies if you don't apply a gap filling tool very, very carefully. And then lastly, QC invalidation, hugely important. Um, optical maps I found very helpful for structural validation. Um, let's go for uh, gene completeness. Uh, MASH is a tool from my lab that lets you do contamination screening. Uh, blob tools I showed. Juicebox is from a Res Lieberman Aidens lab for high C based visualization. Um, Genoscope, CATS, Assemblytics, IGV um, are essential tools for looking at both the input reads and the output assemblies and judging their qualities. So, to sum up, haploid assembly I really think is solved um, by long reads, but the problem is most samples aren't haploid. Even things that you think are inbred or are cell lines have their own variations within them that can cause problems. Um, reads continue to get much longer and cheaper. In particular, the nanopore ultra-long reads are very promising, um, but nanopore currently is still behind in terms of consensus quality, um, but making rapid progress on that front. So we're keeping a close eye on both PEC bio and nanopore technologies. And the remaining challenges really, in my mind, come down to this problem of complete haplotype recovery. How can we move beyond these consensus representations and really recover complete haplotypes out of individuals from diploids, polyploids, and, and populations in the case of some of these insect genes? Um, aside from that, heterochromatin and the large segmental duplications are still an issue. And always new technology require new representations and tools. And that's been excruciatingly clear for nanopore which when these ultra-long reads came about, they were too long, they broke the BAM format, they broke all kinds of things. Um, and so the tool chain is having to be adapted to deal with these new data types. And lastly, I would just like to acknowledge um, my great group here at NIH, in particular, um, Sergey Korn, Brian Wallens, Alex Dilfi, Adang Ri, and Jay Gurry, who have been doing a lot of the assembly work these days, and some of whom uh, I presented results on today. So thanks for your attention, and uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, um, it, I will go ahead and allow people to unmute if they'd like to ask their, ask their questions. And I also have um, a set of questions here that I've received. Um, so one of the, I think you touched on this a little bit, but you, you're talking about evaluating multiple assemblies from the same data. What metrics do you rely on the most in order to choose the best assembly? Yeah, good question. Um, this is a very hard problem in the absence of a reference genome to tell which assembly is best. And so I would say the easiest thing to do is to get complementary lines of evidence that you can use for validation. 
And so I like to, for structural validation, have kind of relied on optical mapping as a crutch for a final assembly versus optical map assembly and look for differences and find that very useful. Um, similarly, you can look at high C maps now and look at which high C map looks more correct in some of the final assemblies. Um, at the base level, uh, then you can look at Illumina data and its agreement with your final assembly. So mapping the Illumina data to all of the assemblies, calling SNPs um, with something like Freebase and looking at which assembly is in most agreement with the Illumina data. Um, that can also be done at the camera level at tool, which looks at which assemblies best represent the cameras that were found in the input data. And so looking at complementary evidence from Illumina or optical mapping data for base level and structural validation respectively. Uh, and then of course, there's always kind of the uh, comparative analysis. And so if you're working with a species that has a close reference that's already been done, go back in and do comparisons to those existing reference genomes, which in many times have been validated by genetic mapping information and so on. And so you can always go back to genetic maps and physical maps as kind of the gold standard for validation or compare against assemblies that have been validated using those techniques. But it is extremely important, but it is a very difficult problem. Um, okay, it's just, I just don't, I don't want to cut anybody off. Is there anybody who wants to ask their question now? Go ahead and type in if you do, um, but I will go ahead with, um, so, uh, there are obviously many things that can be learned from doing uh, some of that initial Illumina sequencing that you mentioned on a sample that someone wants to use for genome sequencing, including estimating genome size and expected level of bacterial contamination in that sample uh, so they don't proceed with something that's mostly bacterial, as you had mentioned, that was a problem. Um, can you give some pointers on just the depth of sequencing somebody should do with that Illumina and what tools uh, they might use to investigate that data to be sure that the sample is a good one to, to proceed with for long reasons? Yes, yeah. just leave the tools slide up then. Um, so if you're dealing with a heterozygous diploid sample, it's nice to get enough Illumina data that you can resolve uh, the two peaks in the camera distribution that result from this. Um, and so I would say maybe 30x or something like that might be sufficient. And the tool we like to look at these camera distributions is Genoscope, which is from uh, Mike Schatz's lab at Hopkins. And uh, that's a nice tool. I think it has a web interface. You can essentially count cameras in your Illumina data set, give it to this web interface. It gives you the camera distributions. It estimates the heterozygosity. It estimates the genome size of these camera distributions. Um, and so we've found that very handy for estimating initial quality. Um, to look for potential contamination, um, you can use, essentially just treat it like a metagenome and use tools developed for metagenome classification to try and classify the Illumina reads. Um, and so something like Kraken um, or our MASH tool, which has a screen functionality, which can take an Illumina data site and very rapidly tell you if it looks like there are uh, high coverage from known reference genomes in your Illumina data set. Great. Um, so what parameters are you using um, or do you find are the most important if you're trying to optimize your assembly when you're running Canoe or perhaps also Falcon and Zip? Is there a specific parameter set that people should be playing with and, and trying to work with? Uh, yeah, so we spent a lot of time when developing Canoe um, to try and make all of this parameter parameterization be automated as much as possible. And so for most cases, you can just run Canoe with default options. You know, it'll ask you for the data type, essentially. So you give it either the PacPy or the Nanopore option. And it should try to select the best parameters internally to give you a good assembly. Um, if you go to the Canoe uh, Read the Docs page, there are some suggestions for how you can make the run either faster or more precise, um, or in the case of heterozygous genomes, the parameters you might, might want to adjust. That's all described in the frequently asked questions um, on the canoe docs. Um, I'm less familiar with the parameters that would be required for Falcon Unzip, but similarly, they have good documentation I would point you to um, for reading that. But for the most part, um, modern assemblers do a good job of auto-parameterizing themselves. 
Um, and it's not like the old days with Solera Assembler where you have to worry about 20 different parameters to set. Usually the biggest problem that people run into is how to configure it for their particular grid environment. Uh, and that can be a bit of a headache depending on your unique grid configuration. But if you email the developers, they're always happy to help get it set up for your particular environment. Okay. So, so it, it sounds like that's, it's nice that the auto parameterization is, is running well. Would you feel, though, that it's still important to run multiple assemblers to see which is, is best for your particular organism? Yeah, I definitely would recommend that. And in fact, you know, for our ongoing mosquito projects, I have four assemblers listed here. And, you know, we're in active status of running all four of those on the same genome. Um, and then we look at the outputs and see how they're behaving in the presence of this heterozygosity, which of them are kind of collapsing those bubbles, which of them are breaking them out, what the resulting genome size is um, as output from the assembler, um, and which of those then work best to feed into scaffolding. Um, and so that still is a very, you know, manual process evaluating multiple assemblies to try and pick which one is best for your needs. And I would say really then that comes down to all of the assemblies are wrong, right? This was on the previous slide. And some are useful. And so you have to decide what is most useful for you in, in particular, what you're trying to get out of the assembly. Um, and if you have validation data that might help you pick which one is best for your needs, that can help you decide. Um, so if a group has a combination of both PacBio and Nanopore, um, and maybe also some Illumina data, how is that best combined for an assembly? Is there a target depth for the reads for the long and short read data? Well, I'm a big advocate of trying to always collect enough long read data to be able to create the assembly itself just from the long reads rather than trying a hybrid approach. Um, it's my opinion that the quality of those resulting assemblies are quite good. Um, if you're very cost conscious, there are approaches that can uh, combine short reads with long reads, but I always find it easier just to spend a little extra money and get enough long reads. So um, typically I would say, say, 60x coverage of long read data. Um, if you're very concerned and one validation with Illumina, then 30x of Illumina to be applied for validation or polishing after the fact should be good. Um, as far as combining Nanopore data, um, I know for a fact that you can do this with Canoe, um, and it generally improves the continuity of the assembly. Um, and I would think that Fly and WTDBG could also combine those, but I haven't tested that. Um, Okay. But definitely uh, my recommendation is to do long reads, assemble it with one of these assemblers, and then use the Illumina data either for validation or polishing at the end. Okay. I know we're running over a little bit. I've got a couple more questions I've received, though. I just want to make sure I answer those or uh, ask those. So uh, I've had Hugh Robertson wrote in and said he just has a cautionary note in the new 80s genome that they had quite a few false pseudogenes from low pack bio coverage and other problems and that those had to be fixed manually with the raw Illumina reads, and they only noticed those because of his uh, detailed annotation of the large chemoreceptor families. So, as you said, uh, it's still in those, those very odd areas, still having a lot of trouble, it sounds like. Yeah, and there is an example in the 80s preprint um, that shows a particular gene family expansion, um, which Falcon Unzip essentially correctly recover the structure of that family as validated by BioNano. Um, but it was very hard to polish that region because of its repetitive nature. Even with the long reads in this case, it was such a large um, tandem duplication that um, it was difficult to align and polish that. And so you end up with uh, a few of those genes that are very high quality, but then some of the paralogs at lower quality because of difficulty in mapping the packed bio reads for polishing. Um, and so in these highly repetitive gene families, like those receptor families, that can still be difficult. Um, but I would argue that in some of the Illumina assemblies, you would probably end up maybe with, with one version of the gene reconstructed uh, and then the other ones broken out as variants or maybe excluded from the assembly. Um, and so in both cases, uh, there's pros and cons. Okay, and then uh, another question I received, is there a way to measure assembly uncertainty? I think you touched on this a little bit. I don't know if you want to give a little bit more on that. Um, I would say that the depth of coverage um, is probably the easiest and most effective metric to gauge uncertainty currently. So if you simply take 
uh, the pack bio reads or the nanopore reads or the optical reads and map them to your assembly. Um, areas of low mapping quality um, and low depth of coverage are almost universally uh, areas of the assembly that will be of low quality or might even be structurally incorrect. And so simply, you know, opening up the assembly in IGV and looking at depth of coverage um, goes a long way towards that. Um, there are some statistically based measures of assembly quality based on gamers and mapped reads um, that kind of um, apply a Bayesian type test to measure how well the assembly represents the input data. But those currently only give you kind of global scale metrics of the assembly. Uh, and if you're looking for the local metrics, map read coverage is still probably my favorite approach. Okay, and this might be the best question to go ahead and end on. Um, are the bioinformaticians and the other people in your group open for consultation on projects? Um, certainly, you know, Sergey and Brian Wallens, um, who do the primary canoe development, are just absolutely fantastic at responding to user queries on our GitHub issues page. And so if you ever have a problem or question in running Canoe, if you open an issue on GitHub, um, those two guys will give you very thoughtful responses. Um, as far as, as more detailed consultation of starting up and launching projects, people can feel free to email me if they have questions. You know, obviously our time is limited and what we can do for some of these. Um, but we do uh, take pride in being as helpful to the community as we can. And so don't hesitate to shoot me an email or open an issue on our GitHub page. Okay. Well, amazing. And thank you for staying a few minutes past the hour. I really appreciated this talk. And uh, we'll have another webinar next month on uh, repeat annotation. And I thank you, everyone, for, for joining. And all the new faces, we hope to see you back next week. Take care. Great. Thank you so much for organizing, Anna.